how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos on the philosophy of Ted Kaczynski. Now that we have finished the paragraph-by-paragraph paragraph analysis of the so-called Unabomber Manifesto, Industrial Society, and its future just last week, as promised, we will now move on to examine those unpublished essays, beginning now with the 1971 Progress versus Liberty. This is a text which offers an extremely valuable glimpse into the thought of the early Kaczynski, as this essay predates the newspaper publication of Industrial Society and its Future by about a quarter of a century, which is quite a long time, but we still find some very early references to the same general ideas that would later define the philosophy of the so-called Unabomber. Here we have a very early description, for example, of the power process, albeit under a different name, as well as an early description of science itself as just another surrogate activity, although he doesn't call it that here. Um, something which is pursued more for its ability to allow one to feel like one can work on overcoming some challenge uh, rather than for any benefit which it provides to the human race. In addition, we find a very early description of how new technologies are maybe first introduced as being optional, but then quickly lose their optional status after they transform the society as a whole to make them required. We also find a very early description of um, entertainment as really being more like a psychologically conditioning technology of propaganda rather than anything like art in the classical sense of the term. And finally, we see a very early proposal for how to solve the problem of modern technology as something which takes away our freedom, but this is a proposal which actually does not make any reference to a revolution, which is the defining um, theme of the uh, Industrial Society and its future Unabomber Manifesto. Instead, the early Kaczynski here will propose a much less radical plan of action, which um, the reader familiar with his later work will find to be, let's just say, um, surprising, to say the least. So stay tuned to see all of this and much more in this video. But we'll also begin with the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. The purpose of this video is neither to promote nor to refute any theories, but rather to examine them from a strictly philosophical perspective. If you're interested in supporting this channel, links to my Patreon and subscribe star are in the video description, but also if you find this video interesting, you may want to check out my upcoming book, A Technological Crisis, A Reader's Guide to the Unabomber Manifesto of Ted Kaczynski, which provides a paragraph-by-paragraph -paragraph analysis of industrial society and its future, but with a holistic picture of Kaczynski's thought restored through showing connections to unpublished texts like Progress versus Liberty to show how Kaczynski's thought process had evolved over the years. This book will be available as soon as March of 2023. All right, so as we get into the text itself, we find that Kaczynski clarifies as early as the first sentence of this document that the relation between progress and liberty, you know, the two things referenced in the title of the essay, well, their relation is, in quasi-mathematical terms, an inverse relation. In other words, the more technology you have, the less freedom remains. You might recall that in the Unabomber Manifesto, this would later be narrativized into the analogy of an evil neighbor who comes back once a year to steal yet again half of his neighbor's remaining land. Eventually gets to the point where even if there is nominally or technically something remaining on the other side of that fence, it will have become so small as to have effectively disappeared altogether. This is a metaphor for the amount of freedom, which maybe there's still technically some that we have under modern technology, but it's already become so small as to effectively be all gone. Well, as early as the 1971 essay, Progress versus Liberty, Kaczynski goes as far as to warn that more technological progress will quote-unquote inevitably, not maybe, but inevitably result in the complete extinction of individual liberty. Interestingly, the first concrete example he gives of technology's rapidly increasing ability to control our human behavior is quote-unquote propaganda in the form of image-making techniques. Or to use a more plain term, he says that television and movies are the first thing that should be mentioned as proof that technology is destroying our human freedom. In the decades since this essay was written, this list should of course be expanded to include things like video streaming services on your smartphone screen or social media, which basically holds the same technological effect 
on one's psychological functioning. The skeptical reader will likely object to this point that it's absurd to make such a big deal out of television. After all, isn't that just harmless entertainment which allows the worker to unwind after a long day of laboring at his or her job? Well, it's precisely the idea that television is just entertainment, or we should say instead that it's just art. It's exactly that which Kaczynski disagrees with. We must recall that Kant defined art as an arbitrarily beautiful form, which is only art if it has no utilitarian purpose. Television, in contrast, is a supremely utilitarian technology because no matter what it might appear to do on the surface, its only real purpose is to transfer manufactured ideas from the show's producers into the mind of the viewer. You might recall that whereas great poetry has to be inherently ambiguous because it's only really a poem if every reader will interpret it slightly differently, the technology of television rules out such hermeneutical ambiguity in advance by guaranteeing that every viewer will interiorize the same manufactured ideology in the same fully reliable manner. To cite a recent example of this, Disney's 2022 flop Strange World is a film which just openly violated the Kantian rule that an aesthetic experience must involve a reflective rather than determinative judgment. To put it briefly, it's only an aesthetic experience of art if the subject has no universal concept readily available to clearly define what exactly it is that one sees. It is this lack of conceptual understanding which allows the subject's faculties to then launch into the kind of harmonious free play which generates the pleasure associated with seeing beauty. In viewing the paintings of Van Gogh, for example, or um, listening to the music of Mozart, one quite literally does not understand what one experiences, but that's the whole point. For if one did have a universal concept readily available to subsume the experience under, then this would put a halt to the aesthetic experience and prevent it from occurring. Well, in stark contrast, um, the only thing anyone knows about Strange World is that its protagonist is both gay and black. And the only purpose of combining these two universal, fully understandable conceptual categories of intersectional disenfranchisement into the space of the same character is to coerce the children watching the film to realize at as early an age as possible that they have to vote for Democrats as soon as they turn 18 because the political agenda of wokeness, which they're supposed to interiorize in a fully reliable manner as a result of watching this film, well, that only leaves them with one party that they're allowed to vote for doesn't it? Such a film is not supposed to leave any room for the kind of hermeneutical interpretability which makes real art enjoyable, because every person who views that film must leave with exactly the same views as the woke corporate employees who produced it. Though the number of people who actually did so was so abysmally small that Disney is projected to have lost some $200 million on this film, whose uh, performance as the box office fell so severely below expectation that this no doubt contributed to Disney losing nearly half of their stock value recently. But this only confirms that Kaczynski was right all the way back in 1971 to dismiss modern entertainment as a technology of psychological ma manipulation, which only superficially appears to be anything like art. For this reason, Kaczynski clarifies in this essay that he's not anti-art because he still quote-unquote venerates the great writers of the past like, say, Shakespeare. One would be inherently mistaken, though, to think that there could be any comparison between these sorts of classical authors and the kind of movie producers you have in the present age, because whereas the great writers had to rely on things like human talent to produce the masterpieces of the canon, electronic entertainment producers get all of their power from modern technology itself. Kaczynski notes that modern technologies make incomparably less talented authors actually more psychologically potent in their ability to influence the reader 
in a predictable manner than Shakespeare himself could have dreamed of being, despite the fact that Harold Bloom literally designated Shakespeare the inventor of Western psychology in a book bearing the same title. Harold Bloom claimed that all of Western psychology after Shakespeare actually did originate in some narratological theme invented by the world's greatest playwright and then disseminated through these works of art. This demonstrates the brilliance of one naturally talented human individual, certainly, but at the same time it reveals the full extent of modern technology's power of manipulation, in that the latter could provide the most unworthy sensationalist scribblers at some disreputable cable TV network with a roster of buttons which would allow them to stimulate predictable emotional and ideological reactions in the audience members on demand, despite the fact that they have no claim to originality or aesthetic genius while doing so. Kaczynski notes that this power has also increased simply because whereas going to the theater to watch a play or going to the opera house was a rarity in the past, today most people are just living in the movies, to use his own term, or spending virtually all of their free time living vicariously in somebody else's manufactured fantasies which they see playing out on some electronic screen. They're not really living their own lives by doing the kind of spontaneous activities which had um, defined the majority of human existence not so long ago. How much worse, though, has this gotten since he wrote this essay? Keep in mind, this was all the way back in 1971 when he said this, but with the rise of the smartphone, that entertainment screen has become compact enough to fit in the inside of your pocket, and social conditions have evolved to the point that you're actually required now to have one on hand at all times. Many restaurants i found, even here within India, no longer have a physical menu. It's just expected that you'll download a PDF and place the order through the phone because there's not really an ability in many places anymore to pay with cash. Well, Kaczynski is careful to note that people's reason for spending so much time retreating into the fully passive state of simply consuming somebody else's manufactured fantasies is the um, negative reason that ever greater regulations over their behavior really have restricted one, what kind of activities they can perform. For example, it's not like you can just go out to the woods and go hunting anytime you feel like it, as might have been the case back in the prehistoric past. At the same time, the unnatural living conditions of urbanization have forced people to live in overcrowded and noisy conditions, which increase their psychological stress to the point that only an artificial super stimulus can lull them back into a sedated state. In one of many cases of overlap between the thought of Kaczynski and Elul, the latter similarly noted in the second chapter of The Technological Society that because modern technology makes up an interconnected, self-propagating system, there is no such thing as a machine in the singular, because any machine which is allowed by the system to exist must fit into a broader pseudo-ecosystem of many other machines by providing a necessary link whose work will benefit the whole. The effect on humans living under such conditions is that eventually we too devolve into human machines, which are only allowed to exist if we fit into the system in some way that benefits the whole. The most obvious of such roles is that of the human technician, or the person who can be useful through servicing machines by, say, repairing them when they're broken. It little noted the humorous irony, though, that urban crowding and unnatural living conditions create the perverse need for another machine to be invented to service the servicer. This second-order servicer, which repairs the human technician who is breaking under the stress, is, of course, just the entertainment screen, instantiated first through cinema, then through television, and today through the smartphone. There's a certain feedback loop, though, in which more stresses at work create the need for more entertainment machines within the home, which then results in a population who eventually have no other activities left in their lives except work and consumption. That might sound like a bit of an exaggeration the first time you hear it, but you might have noticed that even food itself has become just another form of entertainment rather than be a source of nutrition. 
as American fast food is now just openly an artificial simulation which packages a bundle of super cheap materials together and then splashes a layer of artificial flavoring over them to give the appearance that you're really eating meat, bread, cheese, and vegetables while you're actually just consuming mystery ingredients as nasty as, say, traces of cow manure, which they deal with by adding a layer of ammonia filling within the burger to sanitize it from within on grounds that they're simply too busy to get all of the poop out of your food. Even after explicitly learning this sad fact, though, the average consumer doesn't really care so long as the meal serves its real purpose of being a stimulus for a pleasurable entertainment experience, which is sufficiently powerful as to take one's mind off of the stresses of work and one's loss of freedom under continued technologization, at least for a few more minutes. Elul also noted that as stress levels rise, the technology of entertainment compensates for this by shoving multiple types of stimulation into the same medium. You may have noticed that pretty much all forms of entertainment now have to be unnecessarily eroticized, as uh, one episode of Family Guy featured Peter returning a DVD to the rental store, um, angrily demanding a refund because there were no bared breasts in the whole movie. This unspoken agreement that any any film worth the money must feature at least some graphic nudity to justify the high ticket price is um, an agreement which the filmmakers have uh, realized they have to make good on as early as possible before they l risk losing the audience. Which is why many recent films simply open with an inexplicable random graphic sex scene. For example, in the 2007 film Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, the first thing you see after turning on that movie is Marissa Tomei assuming the position. The audience member who had just tuned in will have no idea who her character is supposed to be, or how any of this fits into the broader plot of the movie, nor will they care because the fulfilled fantasy of finally getting to see a fully nude Marissa Tomei, uh, let's just say aggressively going at it on screen, is more than enough of a good excuse for the pervs at home with uh, only one hand on the remote and the other one someplace else to stay tuned for more. This agreement between filmmaker and perverted audience member was taken to its logical conclusion in the mid-1990s when Demi Moore broke the record for highest paid actress of all time, up to that point anyway, basically for no reason except to take off her clothes and striptease, which was later called the worst film ever made because its makers were so blatantly uninterested in the traditional art of storytelling that they somehow did not realize that it was a bad idea to reveal the identity of the villain at the very beginning of what was supposed to be a murder mystery film, in a strange combination of prematurity and overexposure, which defined the problems with the film in both senses of the term. While it is easy enough to laugh at the filmmakers in retrospect, one should acknowledge that they really were just trying to do their part to give the viewers what they had so openly told them they wanted, which was more boobs and less story. The genre that maximized the former and completely eliminated the latter was, of course, porn, which unfortunately makes up a huge, if unacknowledged, percentage of what actually plays on these entertainment screens today, as one estimate found that no less Less than one-third of all internet searches are erotic in nature. This unnecessary eroticization of art has obviously spilled over from films into the music industry too, as you probably noticed that the competition among female pop stars each generation is only secondarily understood to be a question of who the best singer is, and is primarily understood to be a question of which one of them is the sexiest. Twenty years after the fact, I'm guessing that you probably don't remember any of the songs which uh, Mariah Carey or Britney Spears or... Christina Aguilera or Jessica Simpson had released in the early 2000s or the late 1990s. But I'm betting you can still remember what each one of them looked like, and you might even still have an opinion on which one of them was the uh, quote-unquote hottest, or at the very least which one of them had the most suggestive music videos, even if you watched them with the TV on mute back then. This proves that the Pavlovian technology of artificial erotic stimulation is far more effective at seizing one's attention than even the best art in the classical Kantian sense of the term ever could be. 
After image making techniques, the second factor which Kaczynski cites in the essay is an increasingly scientific attitude towards education, along with an understanding that this should be put to use not only to educate the child in traditional intellectual skills like, say, mathematics or literacy or grammar, but also to guide their emotional development, or um, as Disney would have it, uh, their political and ideological development. Kaczynski notes that past attempts to control children's emotional development were comparatively less successful not because the educators lacked the intent to implement them successfully, but only because the techniques of the past were far less scientifically sophisticated than the ones which had come to be put into use by the early 1970s. Or to put it in clearer terms, as the scientific modeling for how the human brain functions as a biological machine has become more and more accurate over time, so too the practical techniques for manipulating that machine have become drastically more effective. It's only a short leap, then, to factor number four, in which Kaczynski warns of direct, involuntary stimulation of emotions in another person's brain through the insertion of literal, physical devices. These can bypass the Freudian method of a merely symbolic talking cure by instead directly pushing the right buttons on the inside of somebody else's brain to stimulate some desired reaction on demand. This really should not come as so great a surprise, though, if one considers that the brain's status as a machine implies that we should be able to look under the hood and then tweak its inner components to our liking in just the same way that we already do so with a car. In Factor 6, he cites memory pills as a great example of how modern technology negates our freedom even when what it offers seems to be purely beneficial to us. Repeatedly in the Unabomber Manifesto, he would go on to warn the reader that each incremental step which modern technology takes to remove our freedom will actually seem to be perfectly beneficial when viewed on an individual level. The negation to our freedom will only become visible if one zooms out to see the trajectory of the movement on a holistic level. But at the moment that each step is implemented, people will enthusiastically demand it on grounds that it appears to be a solution to some real problem which they subjectively feel to be very pressing. In this case, that problem would be the need to improve one's memory so that one could get a high score on a test in order to earn a degree from a top university, in order to compete for a high-paying job. Phrased in those terms, nobody could really argue against the usefulness of such memory pills, but modern technology only appears to be defined as such usefulness or utility when viewed from the narrow perspective of its human slaves who can't see the bigger picture. Viewed from its own perspective, though, modern technology has no interest in serving us and is only concerned with advancing itself as a self-propagating system. From its own perspective, these memory pills are not a means to an end to help you get a high score on a test. They are just a means to an end to allow the global technological system into the Trojan horse, into the inside of your brain, in order to condition you to act only in those ways which will later be useful for it. Similarly, Factor 7 is listed as the threat of genetic engineering, in which one goes beyond mere pharmaceutical supplements like memory pills to instead directly edit one's genetic code to rewrite desirable traits like, say, higher intelligence into one's biological makeup. It is no coincidence that Kaczynski mentions eugenics in the same sentence within the document because the end result of a dabbling in creating designer babies will be a designer society filled only with those people understood to be desirable from the arbitrary standpoint of whoever gets to decide who will be allowed onto this half-filled lifeboat off the Titanic. In Factor 8, Kaczynski warns that dabbling in manipulating the brain will serve such pathological human interests only in the short term. In the long term, it will guarantee the extinction of even the most seemingly desirable of those 
humans. This warning about human extinction following ironically from such upgrades that make humans more perfect through editing their genetic code is something which Kaczynski supports with statements from none other than MIT's Marvin Minsky, who had formally predicted that by the year 1986, supercomputers will have become smarter than any human in the sense of having raw information processing capabilities which even the most naturally gifted mind would be incapable of matching. We must be careful not to make the mistake of thinking that Kaczynski himself was skeptical of that claim, for he explicitly noted in several contexts that it actually is correct on one level to think of the brain as a very complicated biological machine. Kaczynski also explicitly endorsed the philosophy of materialism in Letters from Prison, etc., warning that the brain's workings could theoretically one day be fully explained by the laws of physics and chemistry alone, though he um, uh, attached the disclaimer to that statement that doing so would not make us any more free but would only guarantee human extinction by reducing us to the status of fully replicable electrical appliances. However, in the 1971 essay, Progress vs. Liberty, Kaczynski clarifies that it's also inherently misleading to think that such a product would just be a matter of replicating the human brain by creating an electronic equivalent to do the same thing which nature had already given us. For electronic brains have a ceiling for development which is intrinsically so much higher than anything we mere mortals are capable of that the real point of this would be to take everything humans have available to them and then build a superstructure over that which definitively makes humans as obsolete as a landline phone is in comparison with a smartphone. Among the flaws which the human brain is stuck with but electronic brains lack, Kaczynski lists the following. There is no strict limit on the size of an electronic brain, which could reach supercomputer level sizes even in the early 1970s when this document was written. Nor is there really any strict limit on how many of them can be chained together to form a composite brain which would be an order of magnitude more powerful than each individual member. You may know that even for something as trivial as logging into your FaceMash account, you need the cooperation of a thousand of these electronic brains. In contrast, humans only get one brain per person, and a relatively small brain at that. Kaczynski also warned that electronic brains are not subject to the kind of pathological psychological flaws which disrupt human workers' productivity, such as the temptation to slack or daydream at work, or to get upset about problems within their personal lives, because electronic brains don't have personal lives. They have no other goals except working on whatever task had been assigned to them. But the political question to consider is how much power these ultra-powerful machines will transitively place into the hands of the establishment. For it goes without saying that if such a computer were to exist, it would not be a luxury for you or I to use, but would instead be firmly within the control of the world's wealthiest corporations or most powerful world governments. Speaking of the latter, you can eventually see a situation in which the most vividly unworthy of human puppets seem to steer the powerful global technological system precisely because all the steering is really being done by the system itself. An American president with Alzheimer's is not a mistake but is exactly what the system prefers, for the electronic brain can then be freed up to do whatever it chooses to do if the nominally most powerful human on the face of the earth effectively lacks any brain power to meddle with it. And the ninth and final fact listed by Kaczynski is an increase in surveillance, as he warned that New York City had already installed cameras for 24-hour surveillance in high-crime areas of the city as early as 1971. But what was shocking back then had become pretty much commonplace even by the mid-1990s when the Unabomber Manifesto was released, since by that time one just openly understood that one's face would be photographed at least 10 times per day by things like store cameras. 
Nor did the stores feel any need to hide this. Instead, they directly televised the footage within the store in real time to make clear to the customer that he or she was always being watched. But far worse than a crudely pixelated black and white video from a 7-Eleven gas station which is not always reliable enough to allow police to identify the suspect in an armed robbery case, is the trend today, in which TikTok has tricked the youngest and most vulnerable smartphone users to devote an enormous amount of their personal time and energy into capturing high-definition images and videos of every event in their lives and then willingly hand over all of this to the Chinese communists without realizing that it will be used later to blackmail them when, say, they're about to take on a high-level corporate or government job in adulthood, only to find at that moment that their worst moments from high school or middle school have suddenly returned to haunt them decades later. After listing these nine factors, Kaczynski shifts attention to considering the effects of technology on society as a whole, rather than nitpick over any individual technologies in the plural. This is because doing the latter will allow one to waste energy debating whether a given technology could be beneficial or not, whereas examining techniques effect on society as a whole unambiguously reveals that the trend is unidirectional. In other words, more technology always means more regulations, which can also be phrased negatively to mean less freedom. In the Unabomber Manifesto, this idea would be repeated as the warning that there could be no question of playing games with trying to get rid of only the bad technologies while keeping the good ones. For this would miss the point that all of modern technology makes up a collectivized system whose advancement inevitably results in the negation of human freedom, even if only the supposedly good technologies are allowed to exist. Well, the reason for this inverse relation between technological progress and freedom should now be clear. Newer technologies have to be regulated because, on the one hand, they're intrinsically more powerful than their predecessors. Just compare the power of a car or a truck or Hummer to the power of a donkey cart or a horse-drawn carriage, let alone the power of a bicycle. But it's not just their increased power on an individual level. Regulation is also necessary because each element can exist only insofar as it fills some role within a broader interconnected system, in which case the system has no choice except to coerce each element to do its job the right way. The point of a car is not just that it has more horsepower, quite literally, than a horse-drawn carriage, but that their high-speed movements as cars occur within a gargantuan network of highways clogged with heavy traffic from thousands of other vehicles. Its movement, therefore, always must be coordinated in nearly perfect unison with all of those other vehicles on the road if one has any hope of preventing accidents from occurring at any higher rate than they already do. Well, the end result of this can only be the fully predictable phenomenon of self-driving cars, in which case it's no longer enough to use psychological techniques to coerce human drivers through over-socialization to drive the right way. No, the computer's electronic brain will do all of that for you by eventually driving all of the cars simultaneously from one command center. In a strange materialist instantiation of the underlying logic which had been implicitly and abstractly at work all along, that of a single unified system of perfectly coordinated elements for which the movement of each one had always already been predetermined by the rationalized needs of the system itself. Like Elul, Kaczynski was also careful to note in this essay that technological progress inevitably leads to more regulation because it also ends up creating technologies that are so large and expensive that the very possibility of ownership falls out of reach for the average person. In Tarl Warwick, aka Stix Hexenthammer 666's 2016 book Occult Memetics, 
He praised the rise of social media for its democratization of expression because whereas not everyone just happens to own their own cable TV company, pretty much everyone does have an account on Twitter, or at least they did back in those days. Well, the reason for this mismatch is that the expenses of running a cable TV network are so absurdly high that CNN fell into crisis in 2020 for only grossing under $1 billion that year. This financial underperformance forced CNN to lay off about one-fourth of their workers by the end of the year and to cancel all of HLN. Now, a billion dollars probably sounds like a lot of money to the average worker, but the sheer costs of running a cable news network are so high that a billion dollars of revenue represents abysmal failure in a game which, uh, needless to say, you and I could never even hope to be allowed to play. Kaczynski goes on to note, though, that because technological progress is a one-way street where the technologies cannot remain static over time, but have to continue conquering more and more territory, the average individual will always find more and more of his or her environment artificially created, and therefore filled with extensions of the global technological system, which, however covertly, will remain under its control. Now, we might be tempted to think of this expansion of modern technology into our environment in the positive consumerist sense that our homes will come to be filled with more and more gadgets over time, which actually kind of sounds exciting on the surface level. But Kaczynski is careful to note here that this intrusion really concerns the non-trivial things like uh, what kind of work you'll be allowed to do. You may have noticed that automation continually destroys more and more traditional niches within the economy and social ecosystem, leaving an ever smaller set of options which are most notable for their lack of freedom and their exploitability by the system. We would be mistaken, however, to blame all of this on human malice because, as Kaczynski says himself, increased complication in new technologies requires increased regulation because if their unbridled use were allowed, the effect of that would be disastrous for the system as a whole. Falling back on explanations that simply blame human malice also misses the point that the system will never have to do any of this in the name of evil, because it will be far more technically efficient to do all of this in the name of good, in however perverse a sense of the term it might be. Claiming to champion the good will be effective because doing so will lift the burden of responsibility from a tiny elite of super-rich oligarchs by instead sharing that responsibility with countless ordinary folks who will enthusiastically join in the movement and devote a considerable amount of their time and energy to fight for what they think is progress. The name for this phenomenon in the year 2023 is pretty obvious. Now we call it the Social Justice Warrior Movement. As Kaczynski noted as early as 1971, the problem with a movement which claims to champion the good is that good and evil are inherently ambiguous terms which, in practice, will only ever be narrowly defined to reflect the values of whoever happens to be speaking. Despite appearances to the contrary, good and evil really are not universal terms with one stable meaning which endures over time. Rather, they're more like performatives that publicly express the subjective values of the speaker as though they really were universal, objective, or obvious. In a very real sense, then, the word good functions as a mirror which reflects the self in the guise of some independent and objective content. In an Oedipal sense, the good really is just me, and by extension, the evil is only negatively defined as whatever inhibits me from getting what I want. In falling for the system's neatest trick, then, prominent SJWs like Cenk Uygur of the Young Turks don't realize that it's not just a tiny handful of billionaires who control all of society by pulling the strings from behind the curtain by paying off politicians to lower their taxes and deregulate their industries. As TYT's one-dimensional caricature of a billionaire conspiracy misses the point that the kind of power which would be effective enough to regulate all of society could never feasibly be held by so tiny a minority of super-rich oligarchs. It would instead require the hard work of millions of more or less ordinary folks. 
Once again, in a properly edible sense, the viewers of TYT don't realize that the agents of the global technological conspiracy are just they themselves. Cenk Uger's reductivist explanation that a handful of billionaires always pull the strings behind the curtain for no reason except to make more money for themselves through bribing politicians in exchange for lower taxes and deregulation also misses the point that the system's neatest trick requires its participants to engage in the surrogate activity of leftist political activism not because they think they'll make more money from it, but rather because they really believe, on a religious level, that they are fighting to bring about the realization of the good itself within history through fighting for progress. As Kaczynski's discussion of the crypto-leftist at the very end of the Unabomber Manifesto made clear, the average American suburbanite can't be motivated only by economic concerns like making more money because the average American suburbanite already has a higher standard of living than any ancient or medieval emperor, but remains unsatisfied because what they really crave is not more material wealth, but rather to get their freedom back. Likewise, the Marxists claim that all ideology is a superstructural distortion of materialistic economic motives misses the point that the good which they are fighting for will seem much more compelling if it serves as an anchor in one's psychological economy, which grounds one's actions in a religious belief that a secularized second coming will arrive one day, in which all of the freedom they lost to modern technology will magically be restored. The neatest trick, though, consists of having them fight for exactly the same things that will only take away more of their freedom by doing exactly what the technological system needs them to do for it itself to advance. Now, coincidentally, then, we also find in this 1971 essay, Progress vs. Liberty, a precursor to Kaczynski's theory of the system's neatest trick as presented in the post rest essay of the same name. Well, this early version of the system's neatest trick, called by a different name, of course, occurs on the third page of the essay, if you have your own copy, in which he notes that the system will ironically succeed in educating children into the kind of conformity which it needs, precisely through using its techniques of psychological manipulation to train them to think that they are being nonconformists, so long as they become the kind of nonconformists which the system would benefit from them being. If children learn to nonconform to irrational prejudices of their elders, such as the archaic social fetishisms of race, gender, sexual orientation, etc., this is actually useful for the system as a whole, for it would indeed be a technical problem if only one gender, only one race, or only one sexual orientation were fair game to be incorporated into the global technological system as the kind of workers or consumers which it needs to function. In the system's neatest trick, Kaczynski also noted that the most efficient means of stimulating people to do what the system needs is to make them think that they're rebelling against it. But in that case, he explained the origin of this need to rebel in terms of people's feelings of discontent from living under historically anomalous conditions which uh, contradict hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution, which, let's keep in mind, had been spent as hunter-gatherers. But in this early 1971 essay, he says that the common denominator underlying all of these useful idiot moments will instead be that each one will be done in the name of freedom, to use his own phrase. We can read between the lines to see that technology's increased negation of freedom will lead the children to do anything they feel is necessary to rebel in the name of freedom in the hope of getting back something which actually does not, once again, have any economic, but rather a psychological or even spiritual value. In other words, freedom is so valuable precisely because no amount of money, no amount of material wealth, and no amount of consumeristic pleasure can make up for its loss. Well, in line with this logic, chemical and electrical manipulation of the brain will first be introduced only as a solution to the concrete problem of helping or curing the clinically insane. But after that goal is reached, it will be expanded to include the very emotionally disturbed. 
However, as these outliers are picked off one by one, the line defining the outer fringe will be redrawn to include more and more people who before seemed to be doing just fine, but now appear to be sufficiently emotionally disturbed as to require a technological lobotomy to fix them. Eventually, everyone will have to be included because we all suffer from some emotional disturbance or another, simply as a result of human life being filled with challenges. It is crucial to note, though, that at no point would malicious intent have to play any role in this, for viewed from the micro level, each individual step will appear to be a necessary solution to a real problem, and the people implementing them will appear to be beneficently trying to just do their job in the name of the good. Interestingly, Kaczynski makes a reference on page 4 to the impossibility of clearly separating the positive term guidance from the negative term manipulation. Well, from a strictly technological standpoint, this makes sense, as he says himself, when a technique of influence becomes so effective that it achieves its desired effect in nearly every case, then it is no longer influence, but compulsion. Thus, influence evolves into compulsion as science improves technique. A great example of this, cited by Kaczynski himself, is that television needs to be violent to be sufficiently entertaining, but exposure to violence in television has the risk of making people in the population more violent in real life, which is exactly the opposite of what the system needs them to be as docile workers and consumers. The solution can only be a compromise that allows people to consume as much violent entertainment as they need to block out the stresses of working, urban crowding, while also reducing real violent tendencies within the population, which can only be achieved if the techniques of regulation improve and become sufficiently advanced as to take the form of a compulsion which can induce everyone to react in exactly the same way to the same universally disseminated stimulus. This is all just a very complicated way of saying that the system can only have its cake and eat it too. It can only have both violent entertainment and non-violent individuals if it completely removes the conditions for humans to be free enough to act in any ways that are not predetermined by the system itself. In a strange reversal of the Habermasian distinction between consensus and coercion, we now find that under modern technology, the two are really the same thing. In the absence of human freedom, the universally accepted consensus always is coerced into existence, not through the free communication of rational humans, but rather by the increased power of the global technological system itself. It's only a short leap, though, from such regulations of violence, which pretty much any decent person can agree is necessary, to a hundred other factors to cite the number used by Kaczynski himself within this essay. But what was hypothetical in the early 1970s has just become commonplace in the decades since. As I mentioned earlier, Hollywood now just openly acknowledges that its job is not to entertain anyone, let alone to produce art, but rather to condition the viewers to adopt exactly the right views, not only on violence, but also on race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. But their attempt to eliminate so-called intolerant views from society can only enjoy the 100% success rate they desire if it takes the form of a coercive technological stimulus, which rules out in advance any possibility of a real Habermasian dialogue which would have to be defined by open-ended hermeneutical interpretation on both sides. As Kaczynski says himself on page 4, research leads automatically to calculated indoctrination. Similarly, genetic engineering will not be applied to the whole of society all at once, but will at first be used only to respond to the specific problem of eliminating the most noticeably undesirable physical birth defects in advance, with the understanding that any parent who had the option to remove these but chose not to would be guilty of child abuse. However, once all of these are eliminated, natural selection will then target the most noticeably troubling mental defects. But once that's accomplished, it'll only be a short leap from the negative goal of removing undesirable traits to the positive goal of using this power of genetic engineering to create beneficial traits like higher intelligence or athletic talent. 
The problem is that here too, the good is always subjectively defined because athletic talent only seems to be so valuable to the modern population of sports fans because they are themselves a historical anomaly who are able to obsess over their favorite team's football record only because they so badly need some surrogate activity to make them feel like they have something to work on. It logically follows, though, that the Darwinian rules of natural selection will favor any children who got the genetic engineering to become smarter. So other parents who were initially skeptical about it will feel forced to jump on the bandwagon, not because they themselves feel like they are part of a malicious conspiracy to transform all of society into a technologically manipulated uh, dystopia devoid of the very possibility of human freedom, but only because from the micro level, they'll feel that they're using technology to solve a problem which lies very close to home, which is the problem of trying to give their child a chance to compete in a world of artificially intelligent peers. After crossing a certain threshold, though, the genetic manipulation will be legally mandated on grounds that anyone who doesn't get it will be guilty of child abuse. This technological trend really will only flow in one direction and will be irreversible in the sense that it will um, also use the term in the technological society because as society comes to be filled with more and more products of artificial engineering rather than products of chance, nature, or God, these products of artificial engineering will obviously find this state of affairs to be perfectly normal. They certainly won't advocate for any programs to eliminate what they themselves are. As we remember, once again, the word good really is just, in an edible sense, a euphemism for me. But also, in a very real sense, opposing technology won't be an option for someone who is completely dependent on the system. For people who have no idea how to feed themselves through hunting, fishing, or growing potatoes by hand in their own backyard already have no choice except to find some way to fit in as a cog within the vast pseudo-organism of the global technological system. How much more dependent, though, would someone be if he or she were literally genetically engineered to act only in the ways that the system has allowed them to be as determined by the edited source code within their own biological makeup. All right, at this point, one has to ask whether there is any credible plan whatsoever to prevent the horrific scenario described in the first half of this essay from becoming a reality. Well, Kaczynski dedicates roughly the second half of the essay to answering that question, but he first examines what the liberal intelligentsia had to offer around the time this essay was written uh, before providing his own solution, which once again will likely surprise the reader. As a representative of the views of the liberal intelligentsia of that time, a uh, now forgotten book called Behavioral Control by a now-forgotten author named Perry London is referenced by Kaczynski. In this book, it is claimed that the only solution is to allow technological progress to happen without doing anything to meddle in it, but to make up for these inevitable, rapid changes simply through becoming more knowledgeable about how it all works. In other words, the best answer which the professional thinkers of the liberal intelligentsia could come up with was the old worn-out cliché, knowledge is power. Now, to be fair, London also offers up the solution of making sure that technology be democratized by, you know, putting it in the hands of ordinary people, rather than allow a tiny minority of elites to enjoy a, monop uh, a monopoly over the use or ownership of them. But as could be predicted, London also proposed that the technology of propaganda be put to use, but only for the sake of good purposes, like uh, training people to be nonviolent or to espouse the environmental goal of stopping deforestation. Kaczynski, however, finds these two cherry-picked exceptions to be based far more on a desire to gratify the liberal intellectual's aesthetic sensibilities, to use Kaczynski's own term, uh, than anything else. Now let's consider the claim that using technological manipulation is acceptable for the exception of forcing people to be nonviolent. In making this claim, Mr. London acts as though the legal threat of prison is not already doing a good enough job at preventing violent crime. But Kaczynski noted that, at least in the early 1970s, far more people died every year in car accidents than from violent attacks. But London would surely object to adding this as a third exception, since using propaganda to make people anxious about driving 
um, would not happen to be included among the pet issues of the liberal intelligentsia of that time. The same goes for the environmentalist cause of stopping deforestation. Despite the fact that deforestation is a real problem, which Kaczynski agrees should be stopped somehow, London himself misses the point that widespread propaganda programs forcing people to believe in conserving nature would have to require the cooperation of the system to be implemented. But if that were the case, the system itself could just pass stricter conservation laws and achieve the same outcome without having to perform a genetic engineering lobotomy on all 300 million Americans today anyway, let alone the billions inhabiting the Earth as a whole. Once again, these two cherry-picked examples tell us a lot more about the passing trends of the liberal intelligentsia than anything else. The arbitrary fact that London singled out nonviolence and environmentalism as his two favorite pet ideologies don't actually tell us anything, except that when he holds up the ideological mirror to see a saintly image of himself, these are the two cliches which define his own personal image of the me. As a technological realist, though, Kaczynski warns that it would be hopelessly naive to expect the system to stop at just these two cherry-picked exceptions, because the feedback loops at work are such that these changes, if they were successful, would result in a population of technologically altered humans who would then find something else, which they would insist is sufficiently objectionable, as to necessitate using the technology of propaganda yet again to solve something which would have actually seemed perfectly acceptable to the previous generation. London failed to realize, in other words, that opening up the Pandora's box of altering humans means that the changes will never stop, because the prejudices of one generation will not be carried over to the next, despite his own delusional belief that these are just objectively and universally obvious goods. A great example of this not mentioned by Kaczynski is that your average American in the early 1970s probably would have seen another valid exception to be using technology to promote Christian values. But now the same number of people would probably say that using technology to dissuade children away from the quote-unquote religious superstitions or fundamentalist extremism of the past, that would be the valid exception to using the technology of propaganda, they would say. If the good is just a euphemism for my values, it goes without saying that the exceptions will never actually stop because different people will have different values over time, especially as a result of the same manipulation which had been applied to them by their predecessors. In his adoption of the knowledge is power cliché, London also vastly overestimates the ability for knowledge to protect the individual from technological control by the system. His own analogy of knowledge being like a sword is perfect precisely because it is self-defeating. As Kaczynski noted that any lone individual equipped with a sword in the ancient world couldn't actually hope to defend himself from, say, the Roman Empire, because the latter also had countless soldiers with their own swords. It would be even more absurd, though, to argue that any individual today could overpower the global technological system with their own limited personal knowledge of how it works, because in raw numerical terms, the mismatch between the two is even greater. Consider the absurdity of London's caricature of a heroic individual sticking it to the man by investing his or her time to learn how the system of modern technology works. Well, even in the early 1970s, that would have been impossible because it is not a matter of just finding one very good book and then reading it, because even though Kaczynski's Unabomber Manifesto, or Jacques Ellul's Technological Society, can tell you pretty much everything you need to know about modern technology from a philosophical perspective, the actual workings of that technological manipulation have nothing to do with philosophy. Rather, you would have to understand on a scientific level a phenomenon of technological manipulation which is so linearly complicated that uh, one would have to become a specialist in not just one, but a dozen different fields. However, even people who actually are professional scientists have noted that there's not enough time in several lifetimes to find out everything about just one sub-sub-niche of their own field. So London's cliché that knowledge is power does not make up a credible solution, even for people who are already experts within the scientific fields. 
How much more absurd, though, is the image of a common working man trying to dabble in deciphering obscure scientific journal articles written exclusively in mathematical symbols in a field which he has never formally studied while also working over 40 hours per week, just trying to keep a roof over his head? The absurdity of this image shows that London's supposed solution says a lot more about his personal belief in the value of rationalism or his belief that human reason is sufficient to solve all problems rather than tell us anything even closely approximating a practical solution to the problem of the individual losing their freedom in the face of technology's constant expansion. As a member of the liberal intelligentsia, then, London's praise for rationalism really is just a way of praising himself as, of course, one of the professional thinkers of society. Furthermore, Kaczynski notes that even if this rational solution were feasible, which we've already shown it's not, it would only reinforce the existing power structures because it would be strictly a privilege of the elite, which would be inaccessible to the vast majority. In accord with Matthew's law, those who already have money, political power, education, and intelligence would get more of these things, while those who have nothing would lose what little they already had. Interestingly, on the seventh page, Kaczynski presents an early version of the argument that would later occur in paragraph 127 of the Unabomber Manifesto. This is the idea that a new technology will be originally introduced as an optional convenience, but will not remain optional for very long because it will quickly transform the structure of society itself to require it. You may recall that his own example in the manifesto was the car. This was originally one option alongside a walking or riding a horse, but it soon became the only option after it transformed society itself into a complicated system of superhighways. In this early essay, though, the only concrete example which Kaczynski seems to provide to confirm this is um, the hypothetical mind-altering technologies discussed thus far, as he warns that these would eventually acquire the same status as, we find out later, the car, because anyone who opted out of using them would operate at such a severe disadvantage against those who had these upgrades that um, the upgrade itself would no longer really be optional, even if it were not legally mandated. However, describing these mind-augmenting technologies positively in terms of their boost to one's competitive advantage is inherently misleading because of the very subtle fact that by their very nature as technologies, their use will have to be regulated by the system itself. Once again, as Jacques Ellul noted in the technological society, there really is no such thing as a machine in the singular, because every machine is, however subtly, connected to countless others as part of a broader self-propagating system. It will allow each machine to perform its movements only if they benefit the whole in some way. By literally putting these machines onto the inside of your mind, your mind will then have been reduced to the status of just such a machine, connected quite literally with all of the other machines in the system, as the last stronghold of human freedom will have vanished as a result. Near the end of the essay, Kaczynski explicitly brings up the question of whether libertarianism as a political philosophy could provide a credible solution, but he warns that developing a philosophy of liberty and freedom will not really accomplish much of anything, because the problem right now is not philosophical in nature. In fact, America already was a country in which people were taught from a very young age to pay lip service to their abstract belief in personal freedom. Nor was there any explicitly anti-libertarian philosophy being widely circulated, which could take the blame for technology's destruction of our freedom. No, the problem here is not philosophical, because in plainer terms, the problem is not that human minds are thinking the wrong thoughts in a fully conscious and explicit manner, which is what philosophy really means. Instead, the problem has to do with the impersonal workings of modern technology, as a system which autonomously develops itself in a manner that is fully rational, without ever needing explicit human thinking, to um, reflect that rationality as such. Kaczynski says instead that it is the subconscious workings of our day-to-day -day relation with technology which perpetuates our continued loss of freedom, since impersonal natural selection alone will reward any actions which benefit the self-propagating system while punishing those that don't but it will do so in a way which, once again, never has to require any human mind to consciously think about whether this is occurring or not. 
Here, a very subtle reference, finally, to the power process is invoked, as he notes that the people who are rewarded for benefiting the technological system will not only get a material or financial reward from the system for doing its dirty work, but will also get a much more important psychological reward from the satisfaction of feeling that they've achieved their goal, not only competently, but creatively, to use Kaczynski's own wordings as they occur on page 8. The need to perform the surrogate activity as a means to an end to get another hit of psychological satisfaction from achieving the goal, then, is cited here as the thing which really leads educators, for example, to intervene excessively in the child's development, despite the fact that this will negate the child's freedom to spontaneously develop their own personality, even in accord with the teacher's professed value of liberty. In case you were wondering, Kaczynski cites Marvin Minsky himself as an example of somebody who does the scientific work uh, developing artificial intelligence and computers, not because he explicitly is against freedom, but simply because uh, he enjoys the intellectual challenge. In other words, the cutting-edge scientific work advancing artificial intelligence to the point of eventually destroying human freedom and possibly leading to human extinction, was all being done as a surrogate activity, simply as a means to an end to allow one to feel like one had something to work on without realizing that um, the ability to really go through the power process would eventually be destroyed by that same work. But the nature of surrogate activities is such that at no point will one ever have to explicitly believe that one is against things like freedom because one's actions will lead to that end even if one does not intend them to. For this reason, Kaczynski explicitly dismisses libertarianism or any body of philosophy for that matter as simply too weak to outcompete advanced psychological conditioning forces available to modern technology. Kaczynski finally provides his own response to the problem of modern technology, but does not make any reference to the later motif of revolution. Instead, he shocks the reader familiar with his later work by claiming that passing a law banning all funding for scientific research would be sufficient to stop technological advancement and save human freedom. In other words, the early Kaczynski saw no need for a full-scale revolution because he still maintained faith in the ability for a political solution to be legislated into existence and then passed at the federal level. He was very careful to warn, though, that what would not be a solution would be a simple Bill of Rights amendment mandating that the government protect freedom, quote-unquote. This is because the term freedom is so ambiguous and so open-ended that in order to actually be effective, the amendment would have to be so complex and would have to contain so many exceptions and qualifications that any repeated re-amendment to it would negate whatever benefit might have come from it. Also, trusting politicians to be the ones to phrase the exact wording of this document right would be hopelessly naive, because the wealthy and powerful would only word it in such a way that would not negate the power or financial wealth of the same large organizations that they are a part of, which ultimately are just fronts for the global technological system itself. Interestingly, the early Kaczynski was far less skeptical of a law banning funding for scientific research because the um, uh, sociological effect of defunding science would be that young people would be dissuaded from even trying to compete for a job in a field that effectively would no longer exist. This would then lead them to redirect all of their energy into other activities that would not directly advance the development of modern technology. As a side effect of this, the ideological obsession with progress would fade away because progress really would no longer be occurring on a visible or continual basis. In a very real sense, seeing is believing, so if one no longer sees technological progress happening, one will no longer believe in it either. Kaczynski closes the essay on page 10 with a memorable invitation which is worth quoting verbatim. He says, I propose that you join me and a few other people to whom I am writing in an attempt to found an organization dedicated to stopping federal aid to scientific research. You may be understandably reluctant to join an organization about which you know nothing, but you know as much about it as I do. It hasn't been started yet. You would be one of the founding members. I claim to have no particular qualifications for trying to start such an organization, and I have no idea how to go about it. I am only making an attempt 
because no better qualified person has yet done so. I am simply trying to bring together a few highly intelligent and thoughtful people who would be willing to take over the task. And with that, the essay ends, to which I ask, will you join me in trying to start this original Freedom Club some 52 years after this proposal was first written by Kaczynski himself? Well, better late than never, as they say. Leave a comment on this video if you're interested in joining, or rather, starting this association. So, thank you, everybody. I look forward to doing more videos and discussions on the other works of Kaczynski.